identity space to, to imagine a world where there is no federated identity. Yeah, I mean, there's cognitive dissonance when you were, uh, when you were coming from a horse and carriage world uh, to automobiles and from, you know, various other transformations that took place that, yeah. uh, so maybe, you know, the, 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 the point I, I think is going to be um, how easy is it for ordinary people to use? Yeah, well, I think I think uh, blockchain, in the sense that people have had to manage keys to be able to use blockchains, i.e., wallets. That's their key management mechanism, and uh, we have you know practical levels of security in mobile devices now, and there are quite a there you know quite a few ways to 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 manage those so that you use your device as your is your mechanism for authenticating to access your private keys. So, so we have some practical solutions that may not be used universally applicable, but they certainly apply to a, a large segment of the population. And increasingly that technology is becoming more pervasive. So, so I'm optimistic. So the question is, the question is, is if you say key management is what you have to do, then then you start to find solutions. If you say, oh, we don't want to do key management, it's too hard, then you never find solution. So FIDO2 you know, says passwordless, we want passwordless, we want web auth in, we want not want to have passwords, that means managing keys. So, so, so you're well on the path to, to finding solutions when, as soon as you, uh, you know, say, we're gonna, we're, gonna manage, we're gonna expect users to manage private keys and we're gonna provide technology to make it easy for them to do it in a secure way. Then, then adoption goes up. If you say, well, we'll never expect users to manage private keys, so we always have to have federation, then, then, then you never develop new solutions. Well, we have a couple of more people, um, although not up to our um, usual uh, standard, but um, it is also, it's also going to be made available through recording. Okay. Uh, so it is not a complete waste of time for you to present even to this uh, slender audience, but I'm sure that uh, people here are, uh, you know, are adherents or at least uh, curious about this. Uh, so that is a very good thing. And Well, that's good. Should, should I get started? Um, uh, yeah, uh, let me spend oh, two minutes here okay. because there are some administrative things that I have to take care of. One is that we are, uh, as we all know, a part of the Hyperledger, uh, um, Hyperledger Foundation, and Hyperledger is part of. Um, part of the Linux Foundation. And we have two requirements. One is that we adhere to the antitrust policy. Two is uh, the code of conduct, which means that even if you disagree with people, you don't make yourself disagreeable. So these are the two principles that you have to follow to attend this meeting. It is completely open otherwise. So it is not censored. It's not, you know, just uh, have a, a clean community so that, you know, obviously we don't have to agree about everything, but uh, so that, that that's it. Uh, other than that, we are uh, recording this. And so it'll be made available later and, uh, Dr. Smith, whatever you want to do is fine, but it would be wise to leave space for questions later. Okay. Uh, or even during your uh, presentation. Yeah, I think it'd be better to do questions during. And sometimes when I give talk, I, I'm not paying attention to chat and stuff like that. So feel free. I'll, to I'll, I'll keep an eye. Pop up that, that, that I should address without moving on, just interrupt me and say, hey, we've got some questions on what you just covered and that will allow me to stop and address the question. 
Yeah, so even though we are uh, competing with an important event, we seem to still have about, well, we have the magic number 13, 13 participants. There we go. <laughs> so we are ready to go, Dr. Smith, uh, and uh, we are recording, and please go ahead. And you can share your screen. You should be able to share your screen. Okay, um, let me do that. Can you see that? Is that working? Yes, indeed. Uh, I can okay. see it very clearly. Yeah, so CARI stands for Key Event Receipt Infrastructure. And the, 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 the big picture for CARI is that it, it's meant to be a secure identifier overlay for the internet. So that's a fairly bold statement. Um, so I'll, I'll try to back that up. Um, for contact information, I've set up a evangelism site for CARI. CARI is completely open source under the aegis of the Decentralized Identity Foundation, which is under the aegis of the Linux Foundation. So we're all on the same page there. Um, uh, but you can go to uh, carry.one and the resources page, you'll find uh, quite a few resources on carry. So if you want to dig deeper, you, you can go there. And this particular slide deck, this version, which I've made changes this morning, isn't there yet, but, it, but a link for it will be put up uh, at the end of the day. But just to give you a sense of resources, um, uh, carry is being developed under the diff identity discovery working group. And you can uh, go here to see that there's a documentation repo for the documentation associated with carry and the and we're developing a standard for the protocol. We have meetings on Tuesday mornings. This is the times for those meetings. There's the zoom link and and the agenda. If you want to participate there. There are currently five implementations in development. Um, I'm working on the Python one. Um, probably the two most uh, uh, mature or the Python and Rust, although the Go uh, implementation is going quickly, They're, the Java and, Java and JavaScript are lagging behind a little bit. I mentioned the carry.one site. Here's links to the fundamental white paper. There's related work going on in the Trust over IP authentic chain data container task force, which I'm the chairman of as well. So there's a link to that wiki page. So you can look into that um, if, you, if you want to dig into that. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but there's, but, but if you're, if you're really interested in digging into, into the, the, uh, the, the background of where Kerry comes from, I think the most influential thing is something called self-certifying identifiers, which were actually developed in the early 90s, well, early and late 90s, throughout the 90s, um, and, it, and it is the innovation that makes Kerry possible. And so, um, and it was overlooked. It was originally developed, as you can see from some of these titles, to, to prevent uh, using a centralized certificate authority system for the internet, but to use something that was decentralized back in the 90s before blockchain. So, so it has good, it has good, uh, good roots. It's just people didn't care back then so much, but but now, um, but but now there's there's work in in that space. And I added something here on uh, something related, uh, which from the Trusted Computing Group, which is sort of which is revisiting self-certifying identifiers. They call them implicit identity instead of self-certifying. Um, and then some early papers that I developed in the space, you can read through those um, and they'll be in the slide deck. Um, the, the idea of carry, oh, and a little background on myself. I used to be an academic. I was a full professor in electrical computer engineering, did a lot of research for the Department of Defense in autonomous underwater vehicles survivable shipboard automation and uh, 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 computational intelligence, uh, automated reasoning, AI, machine learning, that, 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 that's what my, most of my research papers were in those fields. Um, I then, at one point, I retired from the university, became a serial entrepreneur, continued to do research for the Navy in various related fields. Eventually those became classified and so I switched to uh, non-classified work in cloud automation systems. And then back in 2014, I started looking into decentralized systems, mainly to solve the problem of uh, decentralized reputation systems and wrote some white papers. And they became influential in the space, um, leading to uh, uh, so, some of helped incentivize or inspire what later became Sovereign, um, 
and a, a lot of some of the work in the decentralized identity space for those who are not familiar. I recently served for a short period of time as uh, interim chairman of the Sovereign Foundation, um, but uh, and, and have been active in uh, open source development for quite some time. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the basic idea is, and most of you are familiar with this, but, but I want to sort of set the table a little bit. Um, the, we have a human basis for trust and, and we have all these mechanisms as humans that, that we can know people and trust them. But on the internet, you can't really know anybody, you can't really trust anybody. So we have a secure attribution problem and, and Carrie is meant to solve the secure attribution problem. And that is, I want to make secure attribution of any communications to its source. Um, that another way of saying that is I want authentic communication. So, so what I want to support is authentic interaction based on secure attribution of all statements by participants in those interactions. That requires verifiable authenticity of any data. That another way of saying that is data provenance. And uh, a, a phrase uh, that David Hughesby uses is the authentic data economy. And I like that because it's, you know, the idea is we want to build we want to build systems that are based on authentic data, and that's the secure attribution problem. So we want to replace the human basis of trust with a cryptographic root of trust, because that's all we have. We don't have anything else. So the, 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 the core tech is simple. It's verifiable digital signatures from asymmetric key crypto. It's nothing new here. Uh, um, we're, we're using the, the, the simplest basic form of crypto. And, and so the problem is, is that with asymmetric key crypto, we can't trust in what was said. We can only trust in who said it, where the who is narrowly defined to be the controller of a private key or a set of private keys. So we can, we can make attribution that a statement, but not the validity of the statement. But that's the problem I'm trying to solve, the secure attribution problem. If I can solve the secure attribution problem so that we can have consistent attribution, then we can address trust in what was said by verifiably consistent statements, i.e. reputation. So that's the reputation problem. But first you have to solve the secure attribution problem before you can layer on uh, reputation. So, so one of the things I found out in discussing Carrie is that Carrie is the platypus of the identity space. Most people, when I start talking about Carrie, assume Carrie is not a platypus. They assume Carrie is a mammal or they assume Carrie is a reptile or they assume Carrie is, is something else because Carrie, you know, a platypus is a unique combination of features, right? It looks like any of these things because it has features drawn, you know, fairly unique to those, the, those uh, creatures, but, but the platypus has them all. And Carrie is, is similar. It borrows features from lots of different systems that you're familiar with, but not in the same combination. And, and so Carrie is solving the secure attribution problem in a unique way. And, and often what happens is that if, if, if I don't set the stage well enough, uh, people forget that it's a platypus and start discussing it as if it were a bird or, or, or a reptile. Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then the discussion kind of takes a while to bring the discussion back. So, so for those of you who are familiar with the identity space, Carrie has elements from the DNS CA system, from pretty good privacy, web of trust, from blockchain, et cetera. You'll see elements of those in Carrie. Uh, the closest comparison would be the DNS CA, CA system, and Carrie essentially it could provide a replacement for that, that, that that's secure because the DNS CA system doesn't have secure attribution. It, it has very weak attribution. So the point of this talk, because there's no way in an hour I can cover Carrie in depth or completely, is to provide perspective and set expectations about Carrie. So if you want to dig deeper, you, you at least are, are looking at it from the right point of view, right? And so that's why I said, look at it as if Carrie's a platypus. You're gonna be surprised, expect to be surprised, or expect to see features that, you're, that, that, aren't, that don't fit what, what you're used to seeing, uh, especially if you're coming from the blockchain world, which is usually the biggest cognitive dissonance is, 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 they make a, is that blockchain people make assumptions about Carrie because it has elements of blockchain, but those elements are put together in a way that, that they don't fit uh, what, total order distributed consensus systems because it doesn't need them. Um, so so the another, another perspective is that I come from a background of uh, building uh, autonomous vehicle systems in hazardous environments. 
Um, and, and one of the design methodologies we approach to that is mission survivability. And in this case, secure attribution, we want survivability of the mission of making secure attribution. And that means that we usually break the problem into the susceptibility, vulnerability, and recoverability features. And this is, a, in my view, a much more comprehensive approach to security than the, than the typical IT confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, approach. I think that's a, a too narrow approach. It misses too much. Um, and, and one of the key things to recognize in survivability is that failure is inevitable. Preventing all failures is futile. That's, that's just a rule of thumb. Instead, you focus on never failing to detect fail. That is a, that is a reasonable goal. Um, so high fidelity failure detection limits exposure to failure equals protection equals security. That's the approach. So Kerry uh, takes that and, 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 and builds out on three principles. Make authentic sources of statements responsible for any, make it a, a, yeah, a, a statements responsible for any failure in the secure attribution of their statements. Enable the secure attribution of any failure to the source of that failure. And failure detection is provided via duplicity detection. And so those, those are the basis for Kerry's guarantees. And, and so I'll explain what those mean, but I can stop for a second before I go on if anybody has any questions at this point. Um, if anybody have questions, please ask. Yeah. After all, uh, Dr. Smith is a, um, it's an academic, he's used to questions. <laughs> uh, I can throw questions out, but I'll kind of, I think it, in my case, it might be better to wait till you're finished rather than- Okay, all right, that's, that's fine. Um, Thanks. So, so one of the things is that, is that in building a system, there's a system design trade space. And so the principle that Kerry used, and if you've read the white paper, it's mentioned multiple times, is minimally sufficient means. If I want to solve a problem, I want to do it with minimally sufficient means. And the reason for that is that it's a way of pruning out stuff that you might think you need that causes unnecessary complexity. And in security system design, unnecessary complexity usually equals less secure. Um, and so I wanted to start with the bare bones. And so I, I didn't assume anything about, uh, about my, my system design trade space. So, so what happened is, is that I started with a bunch of possible things that I could have used, but but, but I built it incrementally using minimally sufficient means. And what ended up happening is I was able to, to, to get rid of uh, quite a few things that I didn't need to have. Um, and I didn't need total ordering, which, or, or, or um, uh, double spend proof. I didn't need share control of anything. And so it wasn't locked to the ledger. So I ended up with a different set of features that solve the problem, but have other features that I didn't have to trade off against uh, that some features imply. And so- I, and I have so, a question here for me. Yes. Uh, you, you gave up on total ordering. Yes. Uh, uh, did you give up on relative ordering? No, what, it, local ordering is still there. The, it, it, what Kerry does is it says that an identifier only has one controller. That is the controller of the keys. That controller is the only entity that can make authoritative statements about ordering. And so we let that entity make the authoritative statements about ordering, which is local ordering to that, that entity and that identifier. There's no commingling of identifiers, which is, which is important if you want to have uh, GDPR protection or support for GDPR because you, you, can be, you can be erased with carry because you're not commingling identifiers in a totally ordered uh, cryptographic data structure. You have local cryptographic data structures that are unique to each, each identifier. So, so this is a short, short summary of Kerry. Um, um, it's open source Apache 2. It was designed with scalability as a, as, as a principal feature. It, it, if it wasn't scalable, then it would have been a failure. Um, so performance, being able to work uh, asynchronously on bare metal TCP UDP non-enveloped uh, messages and events. Um, it's based on something called self-certifying identifiers, which I've mentioned, and I will go through in detail because it because if you understand self-certifying identifiers, then then the rest of carry starts to make sense. Um, so the root of trust in carry is 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 
comes from cryptographic derivations from entropy, not in trusting an algorithm or a trusted entity. It, 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 comes, from, it comes from cryptography. Um, because of that, you have truly decentralized identity because the control over identifiers is not dependent on any shared control of resources. Each controller is solely in control of all of the resources uh, that are used as the, the basis for control over that identifier. Um, this allows us to have something called end verifiable authenticity. What that means is, is that it fits the zero trust uh, design architecture, which is never trust, always verify. Everything is verifiable at the end or at the edges, right? So you have something called key event logs, which are actually blockchains. They're, they're, they're technically blockchains, but each identifier gets its own blockchain. So they're not commingled. There's no trusted entities, which means there's no trust in intervening infrastructure. And, and the end state of carry is we have something called ambient verifiability. So, so if we get to ambient verifiability, then carry has very, very strong security guarantees. To the, the extent that we haven't reached ambient verifiability, then carry, the, carry is, 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 hasn't reached its end state. Um, uh, but but in a good example of its end state is the Google Certificate Transparency uh, Project, which, which provides a, an equivalent end state that carry can achieve. So it's a practical, it's a practical solution. It's not, it's not a pipe, it's not a pipe dream at all. It's already been done, but in a different way. Uh, decentralized key management infrastructure. Uh, if you if you understand self-certified identifiers and everything that's gone above, then you realize that that everything is based on key management. And carry introduces some unique features. One of those is pre-rotation for key rotation, um, a compromise recovery of keys, which is post-quantum secure. Carry is has built-in multi-sig and advanced weighted multi-sig. So multi-sig is a first-class citizen in carry. It's not a bolt-on. It's not a afterthought. It's not like pay to script hash or or some you know uh, uh, custom uh, you know bespoke contract on 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 Ethereum to do multi-sig. Multi-sig is is you know part and parcel with carry. Everything is designed to be multi-sig first. Uh, it, um, so, so that you can benefit from it. Carry also provides a delegated let's, let's identifiers for enterprise key management. Can we stop um, for a second? Yeah. I want to ask a couple of questions. Yes. Um, one is this um, concept of uh, derivation from entrop entropy. Uh, entropy uh, is difficult to achieve, of course, and, you know, um, you're saying that each participant is in control of uh, that entropy that uh, creates yep. the cryptographic derivation. Uh, I so, if, so if you think about the, the I mean, public key cryptography, and actually I have a slide that covers that, but I'll cover it now because you brought the question up. Uh, in public key cryptography, you create uh, a private key. A private key is is captured entropy. That's what it is. It's a it's a pseudo random string of random numbers typically provided by a cryptographic strength pseudorandom number generator. Um, if, it's, if, the, if the pseudorandom number generator is a cryptographic strength, then you can classify it to its cryptographic state. You can say, I've got 128 bits of entropy in this uh, cryptographic strength pseudorandom number generator. Therefore, that's the cryptographic strength of the entropy I've captured. 128 bits is considered best practices, is considered sufficient for current computation. So if I build a system with 128 bits of cryptographic strength in all of my derivations, then I maintain that cryptographic strength. And so because pseudo cryptographic strength pseudorandom number generators are widely available, like any operating system has them, then anybody essentially that can, can capture entropy and, and become the root of trust in, in their identifier because that's what a self-certifying identifier does. And I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail. Okay. So it starts there. It says, everything we do is gonna have cryptographic strength cryptography. We're gonna, we're gonna do 128 bits, full stop. Anything right. less than that. Yeah, is yeah, 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 beautiful. Now, um, because that is the foundation of, yes. uh, of all this, of the, uh, the, you know, the generation and capturing of entropy. Yeah, uh, that's the only thing we have in cryptography. Yes. Everything else is you capture entropy and then you have one way functions on the entropy. All the cryptographic operations can be modeled as capturing entropy and then applying one way functions to that entropy. 
And so, so Gary is designed to maximize that set of functions and minimize dependence on anything else. I mean, the minimal yeah. sufficient means is if all I, if I could do it all with just cryptography, why use anything else? Just use crypto. Beautiful. Now going to the uh, multi-sig, the built-in multi-sig stuff. Uh, it, I assume it means that the same person or, or, or the controller having that uh, multi-sig capability by approaching uh, the uh, signing or whatever it is through multiple uh, No, it means the identifier is controlled by, by, by multiple uh, public-private key pairs. Exactly. And and that, that's what I was going to say. Uh, that right. is that the controller has multiple private public key pairs. Or, or the controller could be multiple entities, each of which have one of the key pairs. Of course. So the controller now is a group. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's go on. Yeah, well, before you go on, one last question. What exactly is the weighted uh, adjective there? Um, so in, the in multi-signature systems, most people use a simple threshold. So they say, you know, K of N, like three of five, two of three. Right. But in enterprises, you want to be able to have more sophisticated combinations. So you might want to say any two of these, any three of these, and any one of these. And so, and so you're basically weighting the signatures differently. They, they don't all contribute the same to the Yeah, person. like a like, uh, guy from uh, um, uh, somebody who's a managing director plus two directors who are in this group or something like that. Right, yeah. So, uh, it, it's, so, so one it's of the things complex. that's... It's yeah, a so, complex condition. Yeah, complex right. condition. So, so Kerry has that built in. That's, that's a feature. You get that for free. It's not a bolt-on. It's not, so that's like, actually a big it's not deal. an afterthought. It's not like, right. oh, let's so, make some, let's make some yeah. custom, you know, thing that we bolt on to a, to a ledger to make it so that we could do that. It's built into Kerry because Kerry wants to be the trust spanning layer for the internet. So it needs to work for enterprises as well as individuals. Right. But then what you just said is that the weighted multi-signature policy, I'll call it, for a given identity model really um, is primary to the governance of that specific identity. That's that's right. Of that identifier. That's right. But but right. If I said is this thing authentic not, or not, I'm sorry. basically going to have to evaluate that policy, and the governance of that policy is huge, and I assume the policy can change as well. Yes. Um, so the threshold so the governance itself of that is, policy is, 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 is critical. Is a, is a rule, through, yeah. right? It's a rule that anybody can verify whether the signatures match that rule. And you can rotate the rule, so you can change the rule by right. Doing, uh, rotation. Right, but so the answer, or I guess the question I have is, it sounds like the entire system is predicated on the management of the governance policy of this multi-signature rule mm -hmm. for identity authentication well, to say, how authentic well, is my identity? Depends on that policy. And it's important to track, as you said, the rule changes on that policy. Yes, and that's what Kerry does. The whole point of carry is is to track and manage key rotation so that it's end verifiable. There is no, a verifier doesn't have to trust governance. A verifier just verifies. Did they follow the rules that they committed to? So, th so everybody's making cryptographic commitments and then you can verify if they satisfied their own cryptographic commitments. You don't have but, to resort to any external mechanism. It's all self-contained. But according to you, yes, uh, cryptic, Cryptographic verification automatically make, is easy. The, the thing though is, is the verifier comfortable with the rules that govern that identity? Yes or no? And that's, yes, a big and that's their choice. They're, they they get that, to make that's that my choice. Point. And that choice actually is fundamental to whether or not the system actually works. Well, it's fundamental to whether the, uh, the verifier or validator trusts the, 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 ident the identifier. Right. So, so I want to point. interact with this identifier. They they make that evaluation. Right. Yeah. So the whole system. Right. The whole system is I'll call it crypt, crypt automatically cryptographically uh, authenticated, which is fine. Um, that's great. But at the core of this thing sits that the verifier has to decide that the current rules in place are acceptable. That's right. Uh, but that's true of any verifier. system, right? Yeah. That's true of any system. Yeah. Yeah, verifiers uh, come in all sizes and shapes. Yeah, and so and so a given, 
ecosystem, a given set of transactions, a given application will have different rules determining whether certain levels of, of, uh, of key management are acceptable to those parties. The, the point isn't that to try to design a one size fits all, but to, 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 to try to design a system that gives the participants complete control over the decision of, of how and to what extent they want to engage. And so, and so it's, a, it, it's a completely, totally decentralized system. It doesn't, it doesn't avoid the problem or solve the problem of, of making those decisions, but it puts the decision process totally in control of the participants independently. They're not dependent on any shared governance for that decision. They can be if they choose to, they can abrogate their decision and say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to set up some entity that's going to that determine this for me or do something for me. That, that's fine, but they don't have to do that. And so it avoids the ledger wars. It avoids the, the, the those sorts of constraints. But, um, but, but I'll show you, I'll, 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 uh, but, but those are good points. Um, and so, and, and so Kerry doesn't, Kerry doesn't have an opinion about any of those things. Kerry says, here's a protocol that allows you to do end verification of the crypto so that you know, so that you can make secure attribution. And, and secure is a function of, uh, of, of your own standards for security. You can say either it's acceptable and, I, and, I, and, I, and, and, and it meets my standards or it's not acceptable. But the point is that you make that attribution. You, you can make that decision. You have all of the evidence. You have all of the information in front of you to make that decision. And you're not dependent on some other entity. So you're not in any way locked to a given system. It's completely, totally decentralized, completely, totally self-sovereign in the, in the most extreme way possible, which has trade-offs, of course. Let's, let's, let's go on. Yeah, let's go on. So one of the, re, one of the advantages of, of having separable identifier trust bases and non-intertwined key event logs, which are the you know, micro blockchains, is that you can support GDPR compliance. That's a huge win because now you can erase, you, you, you don't have to worry about putting private data on a ledger and then, and then the, uh, having the, the ledger nodes have liability because they, they can't erase, erase that information in a lawsuit, which was a, a problem with the, with the Sovereign Foundation had to address in, in terms of we're trying to get GDPR compliance and they never did, never did get a, a final determination from the GDPR regulators whether or not with, to what extent that liability existed. So, so you sign agreements and stuff like that uh, when, you, when you put stuff on the sovereign ledger, public identifiers that, that you have to sign liability waivers. Um, and that became a problem if you, if for you know, public right access without liability waivers. It also supports electronic digital signature compliance. So the regulation for EIDS, UETA, ESIGN, that's the European and the US regulations that are generally accepted in most of the world is that because it's based on digital signatures and the digital signatures and the keys for those are under sole control of the identifier controller, which satisfies the core condition for legal liability for digital signatures. Whereas if my digital signature key state is maintained by, another, by other people, over which I have no control, then I can repudiate it and therefore not be liable for it. So if you want legal liability for digital signatures, then you need separated control so that each controller has sole responsibility for the control of their identifiers. Um, and, th and, that, and those are important features that, that, that Kerry provides. So let's talk about identity system security overlays. So the basic problem is with an identity system security overlay is that I'm using this thing. I have an asymmetric key pair. The identity system maps the key pair to an identifier. I then send a message. I want that message to be authentic. So I put in that message, the identifier, the data and attach the signature. So to verify the authenticity of the message, I use the identifier to look up the key pair. I then verify the signature against that key pair. So clearly the security of that system is contingent on the security of the mapping between the key pair and the identifier. If I get the wrong key pair for the identifier, then the signature might not be the right signature. It's not an authentic signature. It came from some other key pair that wasn't 
by the uh, entity that controls the identifier. So the binding in identifier issuance is the source of security. It is the source of weak security and the source of strong security. There are three bindings that are made. You have the controller of the key pair, because they collect the entropy to create the key pair and hold the private keys, that binding is strong. As strong as their ability to, to keep their, their private keys private. If the key pair and the identifier have a strong binding, then that makes it so you can't mismatch key pairs and identifiers. And if the controller has a strong binding to the identifier, then you can't mismatch identifiers and controllers. So what we want is this trust triangle with strong bindings between these three entities. So let's see how that works with self-certifying identifiers. A self-certifying identifier, the controller captures entropy, uses that entropy to generate the key pair because it controls the private key, that's a strong binding. If it's a self-certifying identifier, then the identifier itself is derived through a one-way cryptographic one-way function from the key pair. So now that binding is strong. And because the controller holds the private key, He's the only one who can verify control over that identifier. The controller derived it and can verify it. So all of those bindings are strong. So we start with a secure root of trust, which is this self-certifying identifier issuance trust triangle. The certificate authority system doesn't have such a strong root of trust. And, I'll, and I have a slide to talk about that a little bit later if we get to it. So what does a basic self-certifying identifier look like? Well, we start with a random seed. We stretch it, get a private key. That's a one-way function. If I do it at cryptographic strength, I have a private key. Um, I generate a public key using another one-way function, typically ECC. I then attach a derivation code to, the, to, that, to that public key. And that makes what we call an identifier prefix. And the reason we call it a prefix is because identifiers control namespaces. So the thing that controls the namespace is this unique uh, uh, cryptographic string, not all the other stuff in the identifier, not you know, the query and string or whatever namespace technology used like DIDs, those are all part of the namespace. It's the prefix that's, that's the cryptographic item. And so in carry, what we do is we have a prefix that consists in the simplest form, a public key with a derivation code prepended to it. The derivation code is part of the identifier. And then we have an inception statement that includes the, the, the derivation data, like the public key, and any other configuration data. And then we sign that with the public key that was used to the generate the prefix. So this inception now is, is the root of trust. It's the start of our blockchain. It's, it defines the keys, it defines the signatures, all secure. So we have this totally decentralized issuance. It's not dependent. You know, I just provide this inception state to anybody and they can verify the root of trust for that identifier. That's the start of the identifier. It's not dependent on a root of trust on a blockchain or a ledger or, or a trusted entity or anything like that. It's completely verifiable. It's a basic system. And if you think about it, Ethereum addresses, Bitcoin addresses are all self-certifying identifiers. They're trivial ones because they're just public keys. They don't have any other mechanisms to make them more, more useful. But, but they are a trivial version of this sort of self-certified identifier. They just don't call them that. But back in the 90s, that's what people called uh, making identifiers that way. So this would be the cryptographic string. Um, this would be a namespace um, using that cryptographic string or prefix. So this would be a full identifier within a namespace, but that same prefix controls all of the identifiers in that namespace. Um, so a more sophisticated one was we call a self-addressing, self-certifying identifier. And in this case, we have two derivations. We, der we derive the public key with the derivation code. So we know how to derive the public key. We then add to that additional information. We take a digest of this additional information, add a derivation so we know how the digest was created, and that becomes our prefix. Now what's happened is the identifier is not just a function of public keys, it's a function of any of this inception configuration, which means we can make our full key management infrastructure bound to the prefix. So we make a cryptographic commitment to our key management infrastructure by the identifier. If I change the key management infrastructure, I have a different identifier. So it's a secure cryptographic binding that performs the whole root of trust 
of this identifier because I've made a cryptographic commitment to it by virtue of the derivation of the identifier. So that's a self-addressing one. And then of course we can extend that. So it's just, it just has a different derivation code, but it's the same, same, same basic idea. I can extend that to multisig by including a set of public keys and the inception configuration, each with derivation codes, and then with the final derivation code that all ends up through with the same length prefix, but anybody who sees this prefix based on the derivation code and the inception statement can then verify the derivation, know that this is controlled by a set of, sig by a set of public keys, knows how to verify the signatures because the threshold is included in the inception configuration. And if I, that threshold is weighted, it's included here. It, you know, so everything that I need to verify that this is a, this statement and make secure attribution, understand we're solving the problem of secure attribution. That means I can securely attribute the, the signatures, this statement to these private keys and the public keys um, and verify them without, without needing any other resources anywhere else. All someone has to do is present me this inception statement and the prefix, and I can do the ver ver verification. And the prefix included in the inception statement, so I don't need the prefix. The inception statement itself is self-contained. So that's the root of trust. And then I can do more sophisticated ones, but it, uh, where I do a, a, a delegated self-addressing, self-certified identifier, where I have a delegating prefix that has its own root of trust with delegating configurations so that I can do nested identifiers and, and which is really useful in enterprise applications because now the nested identifiers basically can use the delegator as a source of, uh, of trust and you can do uh, recovery through the delegator can recover loss of keys in the delegate and, and, and so on. So, so it's enterprise class key, key management and identifier issuer all the way down. And so far we haven't, we haven't needed anything else. All we're using is just cryptography. And they and everything that is needed is is is, is a cryptographic commitment in the inception statement. So may I ask a question? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm probably missing something since I'm, I'm a bit confused. Since I'm, I'm my understanding of the basic concept, but is kind of uh, well, uh, extremely simple. You're just saying, okay, since you have the problem of binding an identifier to the public key which is sometime the business of a certification authority. Okay, well, just drop the identifier and use the public key as the identifier. And then you, you also add the possibility of signing it in order to confirm that you are the owner of the associated private key, but that you could every time do with any challenge. So that, that's not an issue. So right. the basic concept that I got, am I wrong? The, the basic concept no, that I wrong concept. is that that's what a self-certified identifier okay. is. What we've done is but, but that's something that the well, Bitcoin did since 2009. The public keys. We've generalized it to anything else you want to make a commitment to. The identifier becomes derived from from any set of cryptographic commitments, not just the public keys. Okay. Okay. So, so let's uh, say I want to make a commitment that this identifier is based on some other information like a server, mm -hmm. I want to say, I'm gonna put my key event logs on this set of servers. Well, and, and that, this servers practice, my key event logs. This practice of using the public key as an identifier. Well, well, well but now the identifier is the public key. The identifier now is a hash. So, yeah, yeah. so, so this digest is a one-way function. So the public key jet is, contributes to this hash but, what's, but, but the protocol says how I prove control over this hash is via the public key. But the identifier itself comes from a hash of, of a public key plus other information. The, the hash is a one-way function, so it's a cryptographic commitment. The protocol says how I prove control over this hash is via the public keys. So unlike a hash that's just a hash that anybody can create, nobody controls the hash. But with a hash that is self-certifying, you have a way of proving control over the hash itself. And so the hash becomes the identifier. So now what you've done is you've made your identifier a self-addressing uh, content addressable identifier that has provable control. So that's the innovation. That's the, that's the next step in the evolution of self-certifying identifiers. It's not, not trivially public keys, but anything you want 
it is now part of the derivation of the identifier, but you still have the same control in the in one or more public keys. Beautiful. Uh, now you're saying basically, uh, I mean, if you take like let's say the did analogy, the did document could participate in this. Uh, That's right. Hashing. The did hashing. document could be your inception statement. Yes. So right. except, except uh, now coming at because yeah. the did document itself includes the prefix. Yes. And I can't make a hash of something that is the hash. So it's a recursive problem. So yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, so it, it has to be a subset of what's in the did document. Yes, of course. Uh, did document since it contains the hash. But that's uh, you know, that's that's a problem that is there in many, many different infrastructures. How, what uh, what uh, attributes uh, participate in the hash and what yeah, do and not. did peer did peer, by the way, uses that approach. Yes. Did peer uh, public uh, public keys? I mean, pre, uh, identifiers can be derived from information in the in the did doc. You can but, do it that way. Okay, Kerry my generalizes that and, and and provides similar features, but does it uh, for all classes of dids? So did key, did peer, and then public public dids. So my my question is about the uh, witness. That is uh, your uh, inception. Um, you know, row that you created uh, out of those various things, including the signature. Now that witness, uh, in order for that witness to be uh, exposed, there has to be some mechanism, right? That's and right. You so you put, you you, the witnesses are part of the inception configuration. The initial set of witnesses are in the inception configuration. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the that row, that you created there, inception statement, that uh, has to be accessible to the verifiers. That's right. Uh, I mean, either this inception statement or the key rotation stuff, in any of those things have to be accessible. Right. And, right. and in order for them to verify that that is the correct inception statement and the, uh, you know, and the, basically, the wit the witness has to be somehow secure in itself uh, when you present it, right? Um, no, I, th I think I think we're I think we're moving in we're moving into a space of you're making assumptions about witnesses that that I haven't made yet. I, we're, you're you're skipping ahead, and and I don't and and so I want to be very careful because because. Kerry makes very specific guarantees about things, and it doesn't make guarantees that most people assume it makes. That's usually the source of confusion. People uh, look at a set of witnesses and they assume that that means it's like a blockchain, and it's not. It, that's not how witnesses function. They don't. They don't serve the purpose of that. The 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 key event log is the source of truth, and so the witness isn't a source of truth. It's the key event log. So so, and that's why actually my next slide is. The uh, is this slide because this is usually where I need to explain duplicity to understand the guarantees that Kerry makes because this is the this is the place where it's really hard for people to understand because they look at Kerry and says okay you have this cryptographic structure but can a controller and this is usually the question in the back of people's mind can a controller just create any number of inception statements well no they can't because if I'm using a self-addressing uh, uh, identifier, then any change to the inception statement means the identifier changes. So I can't make any number of inception statements. There's one and only one inception statement for a, a self-addressing identifier. I mean, if I use a trivial one, I can, but 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 nonetheless, look, that one's gone away. But if I do rotation events, because now a rotation is replacing the keys with a new set of keys, then could the controller create any number of rotation events and therefore essentially create multiple you know, copies of a key event log for a given identifier? And the answer is yes, that's absolutely possible. Uh, a malicious identifier, a malicious control can do that with carry. Carry does not prevent a malicious controller from doing that. What carry does is protects a validator from harm should a malicious controller do that. And that's an important distinction. So that's why I brought, that's why I had the slide about uh, uh, detect a failure. If a malicious controller is ever duplicitous, I want to be able to detect the duplicity before it does me any harm. If I can detect the duplicity before it does me any harm, then I'm protected. And that's all Kerry has to do. 
Carrie just has to provide high fidelity duplicity detection to protect validators. It doesn't have to prevent duplicity. It just has to detect it. It doesn't prevent, it doesn't prevent malicious controllers. It protects validators from malicious controllers by detecting duplicity. That's so, that's a guarantee. So, so this is a civil uh, protection, basically. This Some is a kind of a, a civil civil uh, protection or a uh, a same person sort of masquerading. Oh yeah, as yeah. Duplicity. A civil attack is is duplicity, but it's but it's an attack on a ledger. So it, it really isn't a civil attack. It's 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 duplicity. But yes, it has the same features of uh, uh, in, in, in the sense that you can create multiple. Uh, so, so understand, if I can't create multiple identifiers, it's not a civil attack, right? I can create multiple rotation events, so I'm inconsistent. So it's more like a certificate, uh, forging certificates. It, it looks like a certificate. It looks like a, a, you know, in certificate authority space, it is the main attack that, that it's susceptible to. And the problem is you can't detect it in certificate authorities, but in carry you can. And so as long as it's detectable, you're protected. And so that's, so what carry does is it makes strong guarantees about detection of duplicity to protect validators and makes controllers liable for their duplicity. And so, and so if you're, if, and so when I said secure attribution, if I can, if I can make, uh, if I can make failure securely attributed to the source of failure, that is somebody either had their keys compromised or maliciously used their keys in a, in a duplicitous way that I can detect that and, 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 and hold them accountable for it. Then, then I, then, I, then I protect, then I'm protected from, from, from that behavior. So, so let me, let me go through these slides. Cause I think this is, this really, this really nails it down. Um, but, but ho hopefully this helps. So in carry, I have a sequence of events. So we've talked about the inception event. When I want to rotate keys. So understand, if I don't ever need to rotate keys, I don't need a key event log. I just need the inception statement, I'm done. Because I'm never going to rotate keys. And so uh, ephemeral identifiers are identifiers that are used a lot in the decentralized identity world, don't have key rotation. I can't rotate my Bitcoin address, by the way. I can't rotate my Ethereum address. So they're not rotatable. So, so they're, they're ephemeral identifiers, even though people act like they're not, they're ephemeral because they're not persistent across key compromise. Whereas a persistent identifier says, I can maintain control of the identifier in spite of key compromise because I can rotate my keys to recover to a new set of keys. And, and I do that with a pre-rotation uh, and I haven't gotten into the detail of pre-rotation. We'll get back there uh, in a minute, uh, but pre-rotation provides protection for that. And if I do delegate identifiers, I have additional la layers of uh, uh, recovery yeah. prote protection. Sam, but, but, but uh, I'm lost once uh, again. I'm sorry. Uh, I, sorry, uh, I can't really figure out how rotation may happen if you have the public key, which is, say, an uh, written uh, inside your identified. Uh, so, yeah, let me, let me pull up a slide for. I'll pull up a slide for pre-rotation. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry that we, we only have an hour, otherwise. Yeah, okay. so here's pre-rotation. So the way pre-rotation works is that in the inception event, you, 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 the configuration includes the public keys. In this case, it's one key, but it generalizes to multiple keys. And you have a digest of the pre-rotated key or, or the next key. So you really have two sets of keys. You have your current signing set that signs the event. And then there's another set that you don't use. These are your rotation keys. So when you want to rotate, these are the keys you use. But the way it works to make it simple is that when you do a rotation, the, the rotation keys become the current signing keys and the rotation makes a cryptographic commitment to the next set of rotation keys. So you can think of your keys as a sequence. I have C0 set. C1 is my next, but I don't actually publish those keys. I use a digest that makes it that makes it post quantum secure. Uh, a sufficiently strong uh, digest is uh, quantum computers have no ability over conventional computers to invert uh, uh, really good digests like uh, SHA three or uh, Blake three, and Blake two also is, is good enough. 
Sha Tzu, it's, it's questionable. Some people say it is, some people say it's not. Um, so if I have a next digest, I've never published the key. I've never used the key to assign anything. It's not been exposed to any side channel attacks. I just created the key pair, saved the private key someplace, created a digest of the public key, and then published it in the inception event. Now, when I do a rotation, I use the next key. I take that out of cold storage, use it to sign the rotation. The rotation now declares this key. This is when I first publish it. It says, this is the key. And you can verify that it is the key because it verifies against the digest. I create a new C2 as the next digest. And now, so what I have are one-time use rotation keys. Each event declares, commits to the rotation key for that event. And then when I want to rotate, I rotate using that rotation key. That rotation key no longer be used for rotation, but it can be used for signing. I make a new rotation key and so on. So pre-rotation is a very secure way to do rotation without having any other infrastructure. It's all self-contained. It's all in line. It's one key sequence. So, so, so that, you... that, that's a, and, and a lot of people have said, I wish they had thought of pre-rotation because it solves the infinite regress problem of key rotation. Most key rotation mechanisms say, I have my signing keys and I have this other rotation key. And whenever I want, want to replace my signing keys, I just use my rotation key and everybody recognizes the rotation key as the rotation key, so I do the rotation. But what happens if my rotation key gets compromised? Well, if my rotation key gets compromised, then I've lost everything. So then I have another rotation key to rotate my rotation key and so on. Because I need to, because any key that I use is weak. The moment I use a key, it's weak. It's been exposed. I, a side channel attack may have compromised it. So I don't want to have exposed keys. I want to have keys that have never been exposed. I want to be able to bury my key in the bottom of a coal mine and have never used it and only use it once. So a one-time use key is the strongest possible type of key. So carry gives you that for free. You get one-time use rotation keys. And you just have to remember two sets of keys, the current signing key, private keys, and the next set of pre-rotated private keys. You don't have to have any other infrastructure. It's just, it's all in this one infrastructure. So, so, so carry gives you pre-rotation. So now assuming that we, we have rotation events, we're rotating keys because they've been compromised. Then we get back to how do I protect um, validators, right? Because I've got a controller. Controller now has protection. The controller can do things to protect its keys. It can use pre-rotation. It can use multi-sig. It, it's got lots of ways to protect itself from attack. But, but a controller can be malicious or in a controller can be stupid. So what I want to do is I want the validators to be able to detect when a controller is either stupid or malicious. And from the validators point of view, they're the same thing. Because what is it, what, how does stupidity and maliciousness exhibit in, in carry? There's only one way for it to exhibit and that is duplicity. So all of the failure modes for carry become one failure mode, duplicity. So now I can be protected from that one failure mode if I have high fidelity duplicity detection. So I've simplified the security problem down to one simple problem. Now, that, that, now the, how good I'm at solving that problem depends on how much protection I have. So let's, let's see what that means. Um, we have a sequence of events. We have inception events and rotation events. These change the keys. Interaction events are other events in a key event log that don't change keys. So we can ignore them. For all intents and purposes, they're not changing the key state. They're just there for convenience. Um, I can do everything with just inception and rotation events. I don't need interaction events. The only reason to have interaction events is I may want to sign lots of things and not rotate keys because rotating keys is inconvenient. So they're there for convenience and performance. They're not there for, for any other purpose. Um, uh, so I define, let me play this a little bit. There we go. So I define the dictionary definition of inconsistency is lacking agreement as two or more things in relation to each other. So I can think of a key event log and say, is the key event log consistent? Is it internally consistent? That means all of the events are consistent so because there are hash chain data structures that then I can verify the whole log and say, yes, all the hashes verify, all the signatures verify, everything's consistent, all the events fit, right? This event is hash chain to the event before it and so on. So it's a fully, it's a full blockchain according to the technical definition of blockchain as a data structure. Now, duplicity has a slightly different definition. It, it's, it's talking about not agreement, but when you act in two different ways to two different people concerning the same manner. So a given key event log can be 
consistent. But if I create another consistent key event log and share that key event log to two different people, right? Then I'm being duplicitous because I'm not acting the same way to both people. I'm acting in two different ways to two different people. So I use the term inconsistent duplicity to, to, to distinguish between internal consistency, which is an event log. Anybody can verify that a given event log is internally consistent. If it's not, you throw it away. If signature doesn't verify, throw it away. If a hash doesn't verify, throw it away. It's not internally consistent, you don't have to trust it. So nobody can create uh, and trick me into trusting an event log unless it's internally consistent because it, it's designed to be completely verifiable. So it external inconsistency is different. So log verification from a self-certifying root of trust, and we I've proven that that you could you have a self-certifying root of trust that protects me from internal inconsistency. I, I can't ever be tricked into accepting uh, an event log. So cache poisoning, uh, 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 DNS, uh, cache attacks, BGP attacks, all of these attacks that, that the current internet is susceptible to are based on the fact that I don't have this internally, uh, this internal consistency proof for all, all statements or all information and all routing. But with Carrie, you have that. So an externally inconsistent log it means that if I have two purported copies of a log for the same identifier and they're both verifiable, that means they're both internally consistent, then I have duplicity. So let's think about what that means. It's been signed with non-reputable signatures. So any creation of the duplicitous log is a provable liability. I, I'm a provable liar. So the only thing I can say if I'm a controller and, and two uh, duplicitous logs exist for my keys are either, I, either I'm duplicitous and you can't trust me or my keys have been compromised and therefore you can't trust me. So, so in either case, if there's duplicity, the validator knows that there's a trust problem and can detect it the minute the duplicity happens or even the millisecond it happens. So, so duplicity detection is the mechanism that Carrie provides to protect against external inconsistency, which protects against both maliciousness on the part of the controller and or key compromise on the part of the controller. So, so it's, re, re, it's refactored the problem into this one problem. So let's play the duplicity game. And how much time do we have? Oh, we're out we, of time. We, we um, are out of time. It's, it's, we, can, we can stretch it to another, let's say 10 minutes. Well, I can, I can, yeah, I'm happy to go if you guys want to stretch it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm fun. good with it. Uh, the thing I, I want to say is that, you know, no matter how much you stretch it, we are not going to, uh, you know. We're, we're never going to get through all of it. But, but yeah, I, but, yeah, but, yeah. But, yeah. But, so, but understanding so, duplicity is essential to understanding carry. If you don't right. understand duplicity, you'll confuse carry with something else. Carry okay. is a platypus because of duplicity. Okay, so uh, back to duplicity. Uh, one thing that you said was that if you're uh, if you see those inconsistent logs, then you can easily say that they're both coming from the same source and uh, they are inconsistent. Yep. Uh, so you, you but if you don't have access to both of them, then what do you do? Then then you don't. Then you can't. Then you can't detect duplicity. So duplicity detection mechanism is something that you need for carry. So the way carry provides a duplicity detection is through a watcher network. And the watcher network is analogous to the Google's certificate transparency uh, network. So if you're not familiar with Google's certificate transparency, um, I can spend some time talking about it, but certificate transparency is trying to solve the problem of uh, forged certificates. And because certificates don't have a cryptographic root of trust, they don't have uh, event logs, they don't have the concept of duplicity, but they do have the concept of inconsistency. And that says, if at any point in time they see two inconsistent certificates being used on the internet anywhere for any DNS domain, then the certificate transparency network will flag it. And that then enables anybody using that certificate to go, I may have been compromised because I only want one certificate to be there at any point in time. And there happens to be more than one being used. So the there's a radical, 
doesn't it's know which eye. one it is. Huh? There is an eye of God, so to say. Yes. <laughs> but but I mean, somebody's somebody's observing the whole thing. Otherwise, you can't detect this. That's right. So 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 in most cases, if I'm going to interact with another party, I I I, I, what I do is, is I look up their identifier and I look up their key event log. And in the duplicity detection network, I ask the question, have there been any, have you detected any duplicity with regards to this identifier? So before I, I, I engage in a transaction and do that ch check, the, um, a global I have God certificate transparency network, which is the end state for carry is not technically infeasible. It's actually not all that difficult. And you have, and certificate transparency is, is global scale with millisecond latency to detect all of the certificates on the planet. And any, any decentralized hash table like IPFS or any system like that could be used as your global duplicity detection network. And so your, so your ability to have that, that observability is, is is practically feasible. That's the main that's the main constraint of, of carry is, is that is that the validators have watchers, not witnesses, watchers make the distinction. And the watchers share information. And it's and they're highly incentivized to share information because the more they share information, the better protected they are against duplicity. So the end state is, is that everybody shares information and the latency to detect duplicity is on the order of milliseconds. And, th and that's the way it is with certificate transparency. So and radical uh, decentralization comes with, radical decentralization comes with the eye of God. Well, but it's a decentralized eye of God. <laughs> okay. God has no control. Well, you we have, have observability. We have right? in, 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 in Indian mythology, there is a God uh, with eyes all over his body or her body or whatever. Oh, okay, so, yeah, some pictures of that. So, so it's a universal eye that ah. exists everywhere, but not anywhere. But anywhere. not anywhere, yeah. <laughs> right. Go ahead. So, so we used up the 10 minutes, so I guess we're-, we're No, done. no, I mean, you know, uh, look, I don't know how we can continue this because it's a very interesting uh, presentation. We we should be able to. You should be able to send it to me, and we we can share it. Yeah, on yeah, it's on, it's on it's online. If you go to the carry that one site, there's a there's a there's a link yeah. to the carry presentation. Hey, Bitten, maybe we can ask questions on the website and then send them off for answers. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Um, there there's also a Q and A in the um, in so your carry carry dot. If you go to the carry repo oh, sure. in diff, okay. right. you can file an issue. Um, if you have a detailed question, and that way oh, your great. questions get answered for everybody instead of just one on one. Right. But if you and, want to send me, there, they're probably that question list is searchable, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah. So we can prevent du duplicate questions. Yeah, the, and there's a, and there's a question and answer uh, actual like in the wiki on the on the website. There's a there's a question and answer, so you can search that as well. Right. But so yeah, if, I mean, if you post those links, that would be helpful to the. Yeah, um, it, it is there on the. It is there on the uh, meeting. Yeah, just site. Yeah. Just okay. uh, I, I'll send it out on the identity working it, group as yeah, well. It, but it, it was on the here. Carry dot one. Carry dot one has links to everything. Um, so if you just go to this one, then you'll get to everything. So it is, I, uh, carry dot one is the eye of God. Yes, it is. <laughs> anyway, so um, it has been a delightful hour uh, and some. Uh, I think uh, what I want to say is my deepest uh, thanks to you to show up and basically uh, it's a pig in a poke. You didn't know what, what exactly you were getting into. <laughs> uh, so you know it's it's uh, it's great that you make yourself available for these things um, and uh, you know one of the questions I wanted to ask was obviously there are several uh, things that uh, weaknesses or, or let, let me not even use the word weaknesses uh, pre-existing conditions or other other things that are necessary for this sort of uh, uh, system radical decentralization to become uh, reality. 
so I mean, I, I was going to ask that on the site and anyway, we'll, we'll have our exchange. Well, but yeah, again, so curious view on that is, is that we want to use cloud and, and, and because cloud's everywhere and people already know how to use it and it's cheap and scalable and all those good, good things. So can we do it with just cloud and key management? And so the answer to that question is yes. If you want to use ledgers, you can use ledgers with carry. So if you want to take advantage of whatever feature a ledger has, you could take advantage of that, but you, but 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 then you also have to live with whatever disadvantages using the ledger have. And usually those disadvantages have to do with governance, control, scalability, performance, and cost. But but you get other things for it. But carry is agnostic about the support infrastructure. And so you can use cloud and and the thing that it isn't agnostic about is key management. But then Kerry says, okay, we're gonna do best of class key management. We're not gonna punt key management. We're not gonna push it off. We're not gonna bolt it on. We're gonna build it in as the core protocol of Kerry is key management. In fact, I call Kerry a decentralized key management infrastructure because that's what it really does. If you can do key management, then you can do secure attribution. You solve the secure attribution problem. And how you protect people is through duplicity detection. And what are you detecting? You're detecting duplicity, duplicity in the use of their keys. So it's 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 a key management function inherently. All right. Uh, like I said, it's been a delightful hour and twelve minutes. Um, thank you. And we will connect. Yes. In other venues. Yes, sure. please do. Um, and for I don't know if you guys know this, but the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation has adopted CARI for issuing verifiable legal entity identifiers. Beautiful. It's is an ISO standard. So CARI has a very important adoption vector already. So the, because the GLIF did present here in this very forum, uh, and they talked about their extension to roles, you know, roles in enterprise, and I assume that uh, some of that is uh, going to be through carry. And I yeah, will, uh, you, you notice we did those enterprise features in carry, so that was very attractive to Glyph because they can do uh, enterprise uh, delegated identifiers, and they can do uh, weighted uh, uh, thresholds for uh, uh, multi-sig. So, so we had Carla and uh, and Christoph. Uh, present, um, yeah, Schneider uh, and uh, yeah. Colin McKenna. So they are probably going to come back uh, here for a reprise. And yeah, I, I'm sure. And, and I work with them on a, on a regular basis now. So, oh, that's great. So uh, now we'll probably have you at for a reprise uh, sometime later to see how things are going. Uh, and I would like to participate in your Rust. Uh, uh, the rust rust get up fantastic yep. yeah okay because i'm i'm getting my rust up to shine you're shining your rust okay <laughs> yeah okay all right well you guys have a good day thank you all right. thank you bye, -bye. bye.